I'm Alan Gravel, I'm the board chairman of the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association Foundation, and we welcome you here today. Appreciate you coming. As is our custom with the um, with AVVBA events, we want to start today with the Pledge of Allegiance. So, if you all stand, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. you be seated. You didn't come to hear me talk, so we'll keep this short. But um, I do have a few things I need to say. Um, one is that uh, early on in putting this together, we were able to believe in the possibility of it because Atlanta History Center stepped up and made this venue available for us and we thank them very much. The second person who, a second organization that stepped up and gave us a green light head forward was Sonovas when they uh, generously contributed to um, allow us to hold this uh, symposium without utilizing any of our funds that are earmarked for memorials or for uh, scholarships or Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. So we appreciate their participation. Corporate values of Chick-fil-A are so well known that I doubt any of you are surprised that they're furnishing lunch today. <laughs> Not reluctantly or begrudgingly, but generously and with revealing a deep commitment to the values that made this country great. <clears throat> we wouldn't be here today without the help of our speakers and our moderator. R.J. Del Vecchio with the Vietnam Veterans of Factual History, and the, the speakers Bob Turner, Michael Court, and Mark Moyer. No amount of money or coercion or persuasion could get these men to travel as they have to come here unless they were deeply committed to the accuracy of history and to helping to uh, correct some of the myths about the Vietnam War. We thank them very much. And lastly, um, many members of AVBBA have helped to put this thing together and other organizations, and I can't name all of you, but I, I have to name a few people. And first of all, Jim Dixon, and then Rod Knowles, John Butler, Bob Hopkins. Those who have participated. <laughs> They've worked hard for four or five months putting this together. So without further ado, I want to introduce our moderator, R.J. Del Vecchio with the, Atlanta, uh, the Vietnam Veterans for Factual History, and he will run the show for us today. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, actually, I want to depart for a moment. I'm at the age where finding myself standing amongst a bunch of people who stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance is still heartwarming. And uh, it reminded me of something. I do a lot of high school lectures. And uh, last fall, I was at a high school, and we were saying the Pledge of Allegiance, and one student did not stand up in the front row and just sat there. And I looked at her and didn't say anything. Later, she came up to me because she wanted to assure me she didn't mean to disrespect me. And I said, thank you very much, but why would you not stand and say it? She said, well, because I'm not a hypocrite. And I said, how is it hypocritical? She said, well, we don't have perfect liberty and justice for all. And I thought for a second, I said, well, of course, you're exactly right. We didn't have perfect liberty and justice for all in 1776. We didn't have it yesterday. We don't have it today. and We won't have it tomorrow. By the way, what nation anywhere at any time ever has? We are human beings. We are fallible. If your criteria for what's okay is perfection, you're going to be disappointed. What's important is what is good. And this country is good. When we say the Pledge of Allegiance, it's not an arrogant claim of our perfection. It's a statement of our ideals, of what we work towards, what we've always worked towards and made progress for, for the last 200 some odd years, 
and we're still making progress towards it. And I said, there's so much more in our history that we should look at and acknowledging our flaws and faults and mistakes and imperfections, there's so much more to look at that we can take pride in rather than shame. And this country is worthy of our respect, our affection, and for some of us even, our love. And therefore, I'd like you to reconsider the next time you want to hear about the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, uh, ladies, uh, gentlemen, fellow veterans, welcome guests, all gentle beings, good morning. Kin chao kui vi. We are here as guests of the AVBA Foundation as part of their continued service to the nation. A lot of us veterans remember that we took an oath to support the country, our nation, and we're still involved in doing that, and probably will be until they put us in a box and stow us away someplace. Uh, they want to provide well-founded inputs on the history of the Vietnam War. Every major human event ends up with you know, being described in later times across a range of ways. Uh, and after all, huge events like wars have layers of complexities. So different people will examine different aspects offered from different viewpoints. Perceptions and biases will affect what is thought and written. Sometimes there's room to see the same event in different ways, even when good people consider the same set of facts. But there's always the possibility of misperceptions, biases, incomplete information, and inaccuracies entering into the accounts that are drawn up. And arguments arise about what is the truest version of history. The most significant event of the 20th century was World War II a war with perhaps the simplest and clearest moral imperative ever known. Yet there's been a bitter dispute among historians, among a few, over the use of atomic bombs to end the Pacific War, in which some tried to prove it was unnecessary and the worst war crime ever, and that Harry Truman was a terrible war criminal. This was a, a eventually effectively rebutted by the facts as shown not in Allied records, but in the records of the Japanese Imperial Council. But it was interesting that that debate went on for a while. In fact, there's still some people who still hang on to it, even though the data from the Japanese are perfectly clear. The conflict in Vietnam certainly had its complexities and has been reported and written about by a large host of people with a very wide range of viewpoints, often from those who had strong emotional positions on what they perceived, sometimes from those who had been very active in their opposition to or support of the war. The strong emotions of the time, which was also a time when other major cultural changes were taking place in the nation, were inflamed by dramatic images of all sorts. Men executed in the streets, monks burning themselves up, little girls running naked and burned by napalm, all kinds of destruction, POWs signaling torture with their eyes, a war brought right to everyone's living room. How to make sense of all this now? The only answer, even acknowledging that people can interpret the same facts differently, to try to go to the most solid, verifiable facts that you can find. Forget all the things that everyone knows. Put aside the dramatic images and look for the facts as best they can be found and examine how those who have done the careful research and who appear to be reasoningly as objectively as possible have done their analyses. Today you will hear from three of the most qualified professional historians there are in the field. As they speak, you may have questions to come to your mind that you would like to have them answered. Please fill out the question cards that are available. We only need your name and which presenter, if you pick one that you wish to question, and the questions. Uh, after the lunch break, we will reconvene and go through the questions and answers and provide responses. Some of the comments we not only have the three distinguished historians we'll be presenting today here, we have a number of other historians here, both American born and Vietnamese born. So some questions you may, write, may bring up later this afternoon might be answered by someone else who's even closer to that subject. Also, I think it's important to understand this was not our war. This was the war between South Vietnam and North Vietnam, in which the South had no designs of the North, but the North was determined to conquer the South under the banner of communism. We were allied with the South, but while 58,000 Americans died in the conflict, over 250,000 South Vietnamese military died. 
Many more were wounded and tens of thousands of civilians were assassinated as part of the terror campaigns. We only have a few books from Southeast authors which present their own view of events and they certainly deserve to be considered as well. With that, I will thank you for coming and all of the AVVBA groups for having the initiative to set this up and all the work that members have done to make this a reality. Your first speaker is Dr. Robert Turner, who has a truly unique set of experiences and qualifications. He published his first commentary on the Vietnam War as a letter to the editor in the Paris edition of the New York Times in August 1964. We're talking way back, okay? Uh, he wrote a 450-page undergraduate honors thesis on the war in 1966-67. He was the director of research for National Student Committee for Victory of Vietnam. He took part in more than 100 debates, teaching and panels. He doesn't take part in many of them anymore because nobody on the other side is willing to get anywhere near him in a debate. Uh, he spent five different periods in Vietnam between 68 and 75, right to the end. Served twice in the air as an Army Lieutenant and a Captain on detail for MACV in the North Vietnamese Viet Cong Affairs Division of the American Embassy. He's written several books on the war, many articles, presentations, and again, nobody wants to argue with him. Uh, we, we had a conference uh, held by uh, VVFH uh, a couple of years ago in D.C. We invited all kinds of famous anti-war people to participate. And we heard back, we're, we're still waiting to hear back. Uh, with that, I will turn you over to Dr. Robert Turner.